Good morning. Let us pray. Father, we do want to give you thanks for another day that you have given us. Another day that we can come into your presence. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are indeed here with us and that you will continue to be with us. Father, thank you for the message this morning, message of your grace and your love that we can never earn, but that you give to us. We thank you. Help us, Lord, to receive your word that it will touch all hearts today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, today we're going to be looking at Peter. It's from the back, maybe about the back end of last year, I found myself thinking much about Peter and you know, just how he was, what happened to him that after that fateful night, the night when he denied Jesus, when he uttered those words, I do not know this man, not once, not twice, but three times. And most importantly, I think for me, thing was thinking how that changed his life. But I think before we go forward, it's kind of good to kind of just go back just to see on the life of Peter and how he was before he actually did know that man and what happened after he met that man. So throughout this teaching, I'll be kind of dipping in and out the different gospels because they do tell kind of give varying accounts, but I mean, it's the same. It's, it's, they accurately depict the events, but different versions of what happened. So, before Peter met Jesus, we know that his name was Simeon, shortened for Simon, and he is also called, referred to as Simon by Jonah, meaning son of Jonah or John. He was married, he was a fisherman, and he ran a fishing business with his brother Andrew. And they were in partnership with James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, it's thought the fishermen in that day, they were quite shabbily dressed, a bit rough. The same now. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of a man's man, rowdy vulgar language, so that's just to paint a picture of possibly where Peter would fit. Boisterous tempers and a lot. From what I read, many would say that Peter was boastful, impulsive, and he's probably the most outspoken of all the disciples and very much noted for putting his foot in it. Hmm? Does that sound like anybody we know? Oh. Might do. So how did Peter meet Jesus? We'll look at John 1, verse 35 to 42. And I'll just read to you. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look! There is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which we know that means teacher. Where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him for the rest of the day. Now Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, was one of the men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. 
Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means, of course, we know it means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, to meet Jesus. Looking intensely at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And they mean rock as well in Aramaic and Greek, it's said. So I read this and I thought, wow, I can just imagine, you know, Andrew's excitement after he encountered Jesus, the Messiah. And having spent time in Jesus' presence, he was buzzing, so he came away eager. And one of the first things he did was to take his brother to the Messiah, to meet the Messiah. And I thought about this. As I reflected, I thought, when was the last, last time I was buzzing and eager to spread the good news? When you got married. <laughs> <laughs> About Jesus. <laughs> when was the last time? I mean, after all, is that not what we're called to do? But sometimes it, you know, it seems as though yeah, you know, you find a bit of treasure, you've got your own thing going, and you kind of want to keep it to yourself because, you know, whilst you're there drawing from the rich resources, you don't want to tell anybody else about it, just in case they take too much, or they might tell somebody else, and then the word gets out, and there might not be enough left for us. But that's not the case with Jesus. There will always be enough of him to go around. There's enough of him for everyone who comes to him. So his resources are endless, so we, we don't need to be selfish with him. He came for every one of us. It is just that, you know, like Peter, some are in need of an Andrew to introduce him to the Messiah. So could that Andrew be you? Could it be me? So now we see that Simon's first encounter with Jesus and he experienced a change. I mean, initially it's a change of name, later to be followed by a change of character. And in my view, this can be the same of us. Once we have that encounter with Jesus to the point of accepting him as our savior, we too, have our names changed, I mean, by association, we now identify with Christ and we become Christians. And for some of us, it either starts or continues the process of transformation, leading to a change of character. Now, I know for myself that I think I can say that my process of transformation started even before I would call myself a Christian. You might have heard me say that I was made to go to church when I was younger. My parents didn't go to church, but they made sure that all five of us would go with my grandmother on a Sunday. And then when I wasn't made to go to church, I didn't go to church. The same is true of Barry. His mother took him to church when she didn't insist that he had to go to church. He didn't go to church anymore. And I stayed away from church for a long time, possibly only going Christmas, New Year, Easter. This was maybe my mid-teens, thereabout, and I stayed away. But then when I met Barry, as he said, every Friday night, sometimes Wednesday night, sometimes Sunday night, we'd be rocking the club religiously. We'd be at the clubs until maybe sometimes four in the morning, getting home to get to work for eight o'clock the next day. And it was, it was fun. And I'm not sure what prompted me. I think one day I remember saying to him, I think we need to go to church. Even if it's once a month, we need to go to church. 
And he said, yeah, fine. So then we visited a church of the area. Still continuing with our clubbing because, you know, we love music, we love dancing. But I think something must have started changing in me and even without me realizing it because the visits to the club then got a little bit less frequent. And it didn't seem like a big thing to me. It's, in a sense, it's almost like it crept up on me. And before I realized it, I think maybe about a year had passed and I had not set foot in, inside a club. And I didn't feel like I was missing out on anything. And I know that now it's, well, it's probably been well over 18 years since I last set foot in a club. And that's fine. So that's one of the changes that I then came to notice. Another was the change in my attire. There are certain things that I would wear then. Not that I, it used to be outrageous, but maybe just a couple of inches too short that I used to wear. And I just no longer felt comfortable wearing them. So that then was another change. I mean, I know that now going back home, you still get a little look of concern, questioning. Mm. But because I'm a trousered person and some people think that, you know, it's best for you to wear dresses and skirts and stuff. There's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just a trousered person. So I reckon until God, God talks to me about that then. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I mean about either starting or continuing the, the process of transformation. Yeah. So, anyway, let's look back at Peter. So in Luke 5, 1 to 10, it says that one day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on, on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Simon Peter, master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon, boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his, to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So Peter felt so unworthy in Jesus' presence. But I'm sure that those words must have done much to assure him that God had plans for him. And so it is with us. He's got plans for us. I know that for me, there are periods when I simply, you know, in my life, when I simply think, God, what am I doing here? What's going on? What am I doing? Why, why am I in this country, this church, this ministry? What, 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 what am I doing here? And even though it's a privilege to be able to serve, there are times, there were times when I felt quite unworthy and have had conversations with God about it, and He's kind of set me straight. But Every now and again, these things do creep in, and you start to question. 
I remembered um, a few months ago, well, there's a word or image that's associated with me within team. Not a lot of people outside team know that word. I'm not going to say what that word is. <laughs> the people who know, they've had revelation. That's what I'll say. And a few months ago, um, I was on a day away. And we were, you know, just spending time in God's presence and talking to him and I'll share my frustrations and thinking, do you know, God, what next? I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I mean, part of what Denzel was talking about this morning, I don't feel like I'm, you know, what's going on here? And just having a really, really good old moan to him about, about me and how I was feeling and, you know, trying to listen to God. I must admit I'm not very, I find that God doesn't really talk to me much when I sit down to try and listen to him. I can't do it. I'm a doer. I'm usually going about doing stuff and then that's when I hear from God. But this, I mean, there was nothing much for me to do apart from sit there and try to listen. So I had a good whinge, tried to listen to him and nothing. And towards the end of the day, there was time for us to pray for each other in, in small groups. And someone in the group said to me, and it's probably somebody that I least expected, they said, Carleen, when I close my eyes, this is the image that I get. And it was the very same thing that's associated with me. And I mean, I struggled to hold the tears back because I thought, wow, that is of God. And what God was doing is just reminding me that it still stands. Regardless of how I'm feeling, this still stands. This is still true of you. So if it was one of those wow moments. And other people in the group then had you know, words of encouragement around that. And then I thought about it. I mean, God, he heard me speak. He heard me belt out my frustrations. But he didn't speak directly to me about me. He spoke to somebody else, and they passed it on to me. And sometimes you think, then, you know, why then not speak to me? But I think if God had spoken to me on that day, I probably would have missed it. So it's good that there are times when God sets people around you to speak to you about you. Because sometimes if he speaks, you miss what he's saying. Okay, so here we have Peter then. He's being assured by Jesus, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So now Peter began walking with Jesus, as did 11 others. But we find that he's also, he's, there, there, there are those ones, then there's the three. So he's part of this tri um, trio, the really close friends. You know, just like we have friends and you've got, you know, your, well, I'm hoping that we all have friends. You have your friends and then you have your kind of closer friends that you know you share things with, you talk to them about stuff. So this was Peter. And he is walking with the Messiah. Both so Peter, James, and John. I think what a privilege it must have been for him. He's there, one of Jesus' closest friends, witnessing firsthand all the miracles and everything. He probably never would have imagined in a million years that this could be him. A privilege, but also sometimes for humans, on the downside, sometimes when our positions are elevated, we can get a little bit up ourselves.
Now there are some things um, that I, because of time, I'm not able to delve really, really deeply into because it could, you could get out so much more, but I'm trying to kind of stick to maybe the simplest explanation or interpretation that I can find. Okay, so just be aware. So now we go to um, Matthew 16, 15 to 18, where Peter, has, Peter makes his declaration about Jesus. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because the Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you, say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Wow. Can you imagine getting such hearing such words and how Peter probably must have felt because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So Peter had received divine revelation from God. And then he went and put his foot in it. We read, we go down to verse um, 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord. He said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, go away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So this is a person who just received divine revelation from God. And now, He's being told, get behind me. Peter misunderstood. He continued to think like a human being. And I suppose like Peter, we also struggle at times to see the divine picture. And why is that? I mean, my thinking, you don't have to agree with me, but part of it comes from the fact that we live in a world where our values, thinking, and responses are a lot of the time influenced by society's views, which can possibly become blinkers for us. One of the things I think this, has, I like, this highlights for me as well is how we can profess Jesus to be the Lord, Savior, Messiah, but then struggle to believe the things that he says. How many of us can deal with the fact that there's a cost to following Christ? It's probably always easy for us to think about the blessings than the sufferings. But does that mean it won't happen? <clears throat> so here we go. About eight days later, Jesus took his trio up to the mountain to be alone. And then they experienced a transfiguration. 
And of the three, who was of one to speak? Peter. We're going to Luke 9, 26 to 36. About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. They were glorious to see, and, when they, were speaking, and they were speaking about his exodus from the world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. Peter and the others had fallen asleep. When they woke up, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were starting to leave, Peter, not even knowing what he was saying, blurted out, Master, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he was saying this, a cloud overshadowed them and terror gripped them as a cloud covered them. Then a voice from the cloud said, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. When the voice finished, Jesus was there alone. They didn't tell anyone at that time what they had seen. So what was happening here with Peter then? Jesus had previously predicted his death in Jerusalem. Could it be that Peter had forgotten that important fact while he's saying let's build these, these shelters so that we can stay up here? Or was he just simply caught up in the moment and enjoying, you know, enjoying what was happening? So he just wanted to stay in that place, forgetting the promised suffering that Jesus had to go through and just be here in the glory. Could be he had forgotten. Could be that he possibly wanted to honor those men. But then after having declared Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, by offering to build those tents or shelters or tabernacles, one for each of them, that was kind of putting them on par with Jesus. I think Peter possibly he might have had good intentions by wanting to do that. But was that what God wanted? The father answered, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And then Jesus was the only one left there. So is he saying that these, there were great men, good men, but Jesus is the one to honor and follow. I think sometimes, even though we might have good ideas and good intentions, and it can be difficult, but it's good to try to discern God's will. Because like I said, he might have had thought, you know, just to honor these men. It might have been good for him to do that. But that's not what God, God wanted of him. So it's always good. And I don't think it's always, it's, well, it's not always easy to discern God's will, is it? But it's important that we, we do that before moving ahead to try and do things, put things into place that we think might be good. So they move on from there. And in John's gospel, we find Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And true to form, Peter speaks up. So this was after Jesus had possibly washed a few feet. 
verse, um, sorry, John 13, verse 6 to 9. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm, going to, what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Amen. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Now, possibly on the front of that, I can, you might think, you know, we can say Peter was, you know, just making a humble statement. I mean, come on, this is a Messiah, you know, you're not wanting him to come and, because this was quite a lowly task to wash somebody's feet. But you can also wonder, could that be pride? And do we refuse to be washed or cleansed by Jesus? Jesus replied, unless I wash you, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Then after this incident, we know Jesus predicts um, Peter's denial. Let's look at the different scenarios from, from the different um, Gospels. In Matthew 26, 31 to 35, and Mark 14, 27 to 31, on the way, I put these two together because they're similar wordings. On the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. All the others vowed the same. Again, he just had to speak, didn't he? I will never even if everyone else deserts you, who me, no, me, I will never. I mean, you'd have thought that by now, him of all people would know not to refute what Jesus is saying. Hmm? Probably just couldn't help himself. In Luke's gospel, this was after the disciples started arguing about which one of them was considered to be the greatest. So we look at Luke 22, um, verse 31 down to 34, where Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. John's gospel has it like this, like this, where Jesus speaks to them after Judas had taken the bread and left. 
St. John 13, 31 to 38. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. As I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. So we catch up again with Mr. Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas, this was when Judas and his gang then came to arrest Jesus. And, well, Peter took on the role of knight in shining armor, didn't he? And leapt to Jesus' defense, chopped off Malchus's ear. So if we look at John 18, 10, then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Jesus is then arrested and taken to the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. So for Peter, following now, it was time for him to put his money where his mouth is, isn't it? And what I've done from this, just to kind of get a fuller picture, um, this is my mixed up version. So, in John 18, it tells how Peter actually got into the courtyard. We start at verse 15, which says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, as did another of the disciples. That other disciple was acquainted with the high priest, so he was allowed to enter the high priest's courtyard with Jesus. Peter had to stay outside the gate. Then the disciple who knew the high priest spoke to the woman watching at the gate and she let Peter in. Because it was cold, the household servants and the guards had made a charcoal fire and they stood around it warming themselves and Peter stood with them warming himself. Then we jump down to Mark 14. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, you were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth? Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster crowed. Strike one. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. Strike two. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, you must be one of them, you're a Galilean. Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Strike three. 
Then we go to Luke 22, 61. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. This is the same man who just a couple of hours ago was ready to lay down his life. He's now turned around to say, I do not know this man. Now we may read this story and think, but how could he? How could he? But I would think the question can be asked, how could I? You see, we might not think that Peter's story reflects all behaviors and attitudes. But if we think about it carefully, sometimes whilst we may not outrightly say, I do not know this man, at times we, doing, but we do it by not saying that we know him. Same difference. When I think about these events, what it highlights for me is how easy it can be for us to be fired up for Jesus when we're in the company of like-minded people. You see, Peter, was, he was happy enough to make bold statements whilst he was with Jesus and the disciples. He even jumped to Jesus' defense. But then when he found himself in a public square of unbelievers, and then the opportunity arose for him to lay down his life for Jesus, as he said he would, he became a coward, cutting all ties and not wanting to associate himself with him at all, simply because he was afraid of the consequences. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. You see, with that look and then the combination of the look and the, and the, and the crow, the cock crowing, the penny dropped. Straight away the penny dropped. And Peter realized what he had done. So he went out weeping. And it says weeping bitterly. So it's not just having, you know, just having a little cry. It's a lot more than that. You see, back home, we call that cow bawling, which means that it's coming from down here, from the belly bottom. That's what I, I, I um, envisage here. <coughs> that cry of repentance when he realized what he had done. Hearing that cock crow and getting that look from Jesus suddenly jerked something in his heart. I do wonder if in that time he had remembered also what Jesus had said. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when, it's not if, it's when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. So we know that Peter's denial did not surprise Jesus in the same way that nothing we can do will ever surprise him. Despite Peter's betrayal, the Lord turned and looked on him. But not with a look of disgust as we would have done. 
I mean, I know that I can give the look. I'm told I can give the look. My look is almost like reflex action. <laughs> A colleague once said to me, she must have said something that I didn't like, and I looked at her and she goes, I feel slapped <laughs> just from one look. Well, thank God Jesus doesn't give us a slapped look. But instead, he looks on us with compassion and love, just as he did Peter. That look which started Peter on the course of repentance. So then we catch up with Peter again at Jesus' resurrection when he ran to the tomb. And we know that Jesus then appeared to his disciples as they were hiding away in a locked room. After that, we hear of Peter going fishing with some of the other disciples. But despite spending all night, they still had not caught anything. Then came dawn and Jesus was standing on the shore and called out to them, and told them to throw their nets on the right-hand side of the boat, after which they pulled in a great big haul of fish. We go to John 21, 7. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for apparently he had stripped for work, and jumped into the water and headed for the shore. Jesus served them breakfast, and in verse 15, we see that after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lamb, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know how I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. We're reminded of Peter being questioned three times about his association with Jesus. And now Jesus questioned Peter three times about his love for him and tasking him with looking after God's flock. You see, Peter had been forgiven, restored, and recommissioned as an apostle. He was now challenged to abandon his former life and be exclusively devoted to following Jesus based on his love. We know in the book of Acts, after Pentecost, now having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter gave his first sermon. We go to Acts 1. Then Peter stepped forward, starting at verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God had made this Jesus, whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. This is the same Peter 
who was afraid to associate himself with Jesus in the public square, he's now telling people about Jesus. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that Peter continued to preach, heal, even suffered and died for Christ. It is said that Peter, because we know that Peter was crucified, it is said that he requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't count himself worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Now I feel like I've been on a journey with this man. So let's see if there are any lessons that we can learn from or take from his story. And I've picked up a few which I'm calling just like us lessons. So we know that Peter was human, just like us. And as such, experienced human failings, just like us. Though he was walking with Jesus, just like us, he messed up, just like us. He had to go through a process of change, just like us. He had to repent, just like us. He needed the Holy Spirit, just like us. And it is that spirit within Peter that then enabled him to go forth and do the work that Jesus left for him to do. And even though it's something that we talk about all the time, that's an important thing, I think, for us to grasp. You see, in the beginning, Peter did things on impulse and he displayed signs of pride. He was boastful and quite frankly, in my view, sometimes a little bit of himself. But through all of his ups and downs, the Lord Jesus remained his loving Lord and his faithful guide. Never left him. I'm sure we all know what they say about pride. Goes before a fall. Well, Peter fell and he fell hard. We would use the term back home and get a bitch drop. But what would have happened to him had he not had that fall? Maybe we might not even be reading about him. I don't know. The songwriter says, if I'm too high, Lord, bring me down. And it can't hurt to make that our prayer. You see, Peter fell because he wanted to do things his way, in his strength. But let's not make that mistake that it can never happen to me. For me, the key thing to remember in all of this is getting up from the fall. You see, anyone can fall. And to be honest, most of us will at some point, and not just once, I hasten to add. But it's what we do after the fall that's important. Do we stay down, wallow in self-pity, hang our head in shame, or do we go out and weep bitterly, then rush to join Jesus for breakfast, allow him to feed us, restore us, and recommission us? One of the things I've thought about with Peter as well was, I just wondered really how he was received by the others after what he did. Did any of them have a dig at him? Was he shunned at any point? I don't know. But it would seem the normal reaction for us, wouldn't it? Someone slips up, we write them off, wash our hands, don't want to have nothing more to do with them. 
Can you imagine if Jesus did that to us when we denied him? As Jesus prayed for Peter, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Let us pray for all fallen brothers and sisters that their faith will not fail and they will repent and return to Jesus to do the work he's commissioned them to do. Peter's story for me is one of hope and restoration. And I would say that if you get nothing else from today's teaching, get this, God has not written you off and he never will. So it's not too late. The important thing if we fall is what we do after that fall. You see, there was a noticeable change in Peter after he received the Holy Spirit. And the things that he later accomplished, it was not because of himself. It was because Christ was living in him. And the same will be true for us. If we, in Peter's words, in 1 Peter 5, 6, say, therefore, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Amen. Thank you. Do that. I might have finished early, I think. No? Well, that's all right then. <laughs> you want to pray? So... Before we rush off, let's just close in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross, for your forgiveness, for that look of love and compassion. Father, help it to pierce our hearts where it needs to, Father God, to trigger the change that needs to be made in us, Father. To strengthen us. To go forth and do what you have called us to do. Father, we thank you for your, the gift of your spirit that lives in us when we accept you as our Lord and Savior. Father, we pray that you will help us to allow that gift of the Holy Spirit to change and transform us. Father, we thank you. You have not written us off and you never will. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.